Yes, is this Daniel? Yes, yes, hi. Hello. Thank you, sir, for calling in. We were just uh, filling in some time before you came on and talking about the early colon- colonialism and Ann Hutchinson is what we were just getting ready to get into, but we're going to drop oh. that one. Should I, uh, should I call back a bit later? Or? Heck no. Are you kidding me? We can... We do this every week, so we can go back to that. <laughs> Let me introduce you real quick, though. This is uh, We have Mr. Daniel McAdams on with us. He is the director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, which we should talk about how those two coincide. And um, lately, I don't know, hopefully if the listeners check out that uh, – you and Dr. Ron Paul have started the Liberty Report, which I anxiously await for daily. And when I don't get it, I get upset. I'm like, what the heck? These guys are getting lazy on me. Come on. We need one every day. <laughs> but I, I think I heard you tell uh, uh, Tom Woods recently that you guys are just still in the beta planning on that. You haven't even launched it, really. Not really. We're just testing. And, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really long story. Um <clears throat> And Dr. Paul is no longer affiliated with the Voices of Liberty, and he wants to continue doing what he's doing, and he wants to do it in his own way. So we, um, we're basically uh, rebuilding a studio uh, from what was a an empty room as of about a week ago. Uh, the, our early our early editions of the show were done in the old studio, which is now gone. But we did kind of a test this morning on the new studio, and it looks it looks much nicer and much better. It's a lot more high tech. So awesome. This is a lot of a lot of fancy knobs in there, which is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> That's we're exciting. Gonna, we're going to play around with it a little bit more. We're still working on things like the titles and the logos and things like that. But Dr. Paul feels like if you know if if it's if it's even if it's even halfway good, let's at least put it out there. Yeah. You know. It doesn't even. But, with you two, it doesn't have to be halfway good. It just if it's even one percent, <laughs> put it out because. <laughs> No, it's been excellent. I've I've really enjoyed it. Thank and, you very uh, much. What I like about your guys' format right now, the way the way it's been done, is that uh, the way you two bounce off each other and just kind of talk, it's almost like you're sitting in the living room, and when I'm watching, I feel like I'm sitting in the living room with you and just kind of hearing a conversation and just listening. I love that. I really we- like that. When we initially talked about in that sort of reluctant on my part, although it's a great honor to be with him, but when we sort of talked about doing it together after the the Voices of Liberty wound down, is uh, we thought, hey, let's kind of make it like when I used to go into his office up on Capitol Hill, <laughs> and we sit down with a few notes and chew over some things, and you know, so that's kind of the inspiration for it. That's awesome. So, yeah, and how, how long were you with uh, Dr. Paul in his congressional days? I came on board, believe it or not, right after 9-11. Um, wow. I was, I was initially waiting for the job offer. I was, uh, you know, biting my fingernails. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden the 9-11 attack came. I thought, oh, no, my chance is gone. Because the, the, the fellow who, who left, I thought maybe would change his mind. So I was pretty nervous. But I was there from there until, um, until Dr. Paul retired at the end of, uh, what was it, the end of 2013. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and retired is kind of a uh, subjective word there because he's retired maybe from Congress, but he is rolling full smoke on uh, liberty issues and foreign policy. It's great. He's working, I think, a lot harder now than he did then. And to be <laughs> honest, you know, I'm, I'm slightly younger than him, but I find it very difficult to keep up with him. <laughs> <laughs> that is very – that's awesome. You know, I – I don't want to, I wanted to introduce more to you. The, the, let's talk about the Ron Paul Institute because um, you guys are doing great. And you're on uh, so many things. It, folks can find you on Lou Rockwell's blog, Lou Rockwell's regular page. You can find you're writing on uh, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity constantly. You're on RT. I, I literally look every morning when I wake up, start my breakfast or whatever, I look – I wonder if Daniel McAdams has an interview on RT today, which is the Russian Times, which I think is so fantastic that they ask for you so often because you tell the truth. And every time I watch, I think, oh, yeah, I think of the uh, detractors of, uh, yeah, Mr. Putin lover. And, and no, yeah. <laughs> no, you, you're just there to tell the truth. That's so fantastic. It, that And they're letting it be broadcast. You know, the... 
if you listen to uh, the great libertarian Glenn Beck, <laughs> <laughs> he hammers on RT all the time. Oh, it's just uh, government radio, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, maybe they are. But they have Daniel McAdams on all the time, so you get to hear the truth all the time, and I think that's fantastic. It's just great. Well, you know, he's, Beck is such a hypocrite because have you ever heard him yelling about all the money we spend on the Broadcasting Board of Governors? You know, <laughs> so, I mean, it, I, I even said I even said on RT a, a couple of times ago, I said I'm not a fan of, of any state funded media, yep. but the fact of the matter is, the U.S. spends at least three times as much on its state-funded media as it's spent on RT. You know, and, and none of the Glenn Becks of this country or the or the other neocons, they don't even want to talk about that because they're just being hypocrites. Yes. It's not that they object to state-funded TV. They object to anything that challenges their line, which is the neocon line on foreign policy. Yep, that is, that is exactly right. I remember watching when you uh, talked about that, and I, and I thought that was a great point because it's... It's uh, kind of a putting the shutters in front of your eyes that, oh, yeah, the other countries of the world, they have state indoctrinated media, but not the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Such a joke. Um, well, thankfully, thankfully, we still have the Internet. We still have programs like yours that are out there telling the truth. Hopefully the, uh, the net neutrality won't kill us all. <laughs> but, but we still have some outlets, thankfully. Yep. Well, we have the Ron Paul Institute. That's... That's a plus right there in big time. What what if uh let's talk if you would before we get into foreign policy and jerks like cotton and stuff like that. Can you explain how important prosper how prosperity lines up with peace? Cuz I I think it's really interesting that the way you guys call this the Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Do you want to speak yeah, I, to that, how, how prosperity is aligned with peace? And it's so critical, you know, because although we don't, we don't explicitly uh, get super involved in some of the finance things that Dr. Paul is well known for, we, we do, I mean, the nexus is so much there that, that um, the crossover between what the Fed does here in the U.S. and what the Fed does overseas and how without the Federal Reserve printing money out of thin air, there would be no money for war. Because if people were forced to actually pay up front for what the machines cost, they'd start, they'd start getting upset. You know, it's like when you shop with your credit card. You never really realize what your balance is until maybe a few months later and you think, oh, my God, what have I done? You know, the same happens to Americans. Uh, it's all hidden in inflation. Uh, you know, they don't see it up front. And so they think that it's all free money. This trillion dollars here, trillion dollars there. It's all free money. But... You know, it's all about opportunity costs. What if, this, what if our, our, our wealth was not being inflated away by the Federal Reserve? What if all the money wasn't going to crony capitalists, uh, you know, and corporate welfare? What if that money were, and to the military-industrial complex, hmm. what if that money were available for investment here at home? Uh, imagine all of the uh, amazing inventions that we would have. Imagine all of the vexing problems that, that probably would be solved if that money was freed up. So... The, true, the two are so intrinsically entwined that you just can't separate them. And in a way, it's, a, it's sort of a shot back at the neocons and the interventionists who believe that, you know, that, you know they, they've, they've gotten away with telling this lie that, that war is great for the economy. They always say that uh, in one way or the other. So it's, it really, it's to make a point that, no, the opposite is true. Peace is great for the economy. Peace and trade are great for the economy. They're great for small business owners. Medium enterprises, you know, they're, they're great for everyone. Yeah, and we see that historically after World War II, where the uh, so many soldiers and everything coming back from the war, and it was expected to have a, a another depression because oh, we don't have the war economy anymore. Mm -hmm. Then you look at 1946, and the economy just went robust, boom, in in the peacetime, and it's just. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Last the other day, I was reading um, or watched a video from Dr. Paul because we're at the uh, was, we just had the uh, Iraq War anniversary. Yeah, and he was giving a speech and he said, 
this war, they're saying, is going to cost us $100 billion. He said, we can't afford $100 billion. Are you kidding me? And, and now where are we? Just over a trillion dollars in the war? <laughs> in the I, was just telling him, I was just telling him the other day about that speech, uh, that, that exact speech, and I said, you sure lowballed that one. <laughs> yeah, no joke. <laughs> because you know, at, the time, at the time, it seemed so outrageous. People couldn't believe he would say something so irresponsible. That it would cost a hundred billion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, that was uh, about ten times short. Amazing, yeah. amazing. But he, and he was on the forefront calling that one out. No doubt about it. And how much more? How much more prosperity would we have if we hadn't wasted that trillion dollars? Yep. Oh, that's. I mean, I'm not. I'm not a fan of domestic spending either. But you know, even even the left, the the, the, the honest progressives on the left make a pretty compelling point when they say, what if all that money were poured into, you know, providing free lunches or health care or something? You know, even though I'm not a huge fan of it, at least it's not wasted on the war machine and all the and all the fancy people in the Washington, D.C. area living in fantastic huge houses and places like Great Falls and McLean, you know. <laughs> yep. Right. And then all those fat cats that uh, when you look at the uh, – you know, there's different things on YouTube and whatnot where they're having their big galas and parties and just living it up high on the hog on the backs of the people while they send young boys and women overseas to die and get maimed. Mm -hmm. It's just, yes. it's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. Yeah, absolutely. But you guys are doing a good job. So I want to... No, you're not doing a good job. You guys are on the, on the edge. I love it. I, I totally... Even the last time you were with us, I, I made the comment that you guys are doing way more good now, I think. Even though I'm not trying to detract from when Dr. Paul was in Congress because he opened so many people's eyes, including mine. But now it's just like taking the gloves off and going for it. It's great. Well, it's, been a, it's been a real different experience because, especially for me as a staffer when I worked for Dr. Paul, you know, you had to keep invisible. You know, it was only staffers who were who were in trouble that you'd hear about. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of have that ingrained in you that you you don't want to to have any attention. But you know, when we started this institute, obviously we have to we have to get people's attention. We have to to get them to see what we're doing. And so it it, it has been different and 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 a real switch in the way things have been for a long time. Yeah, well, even the mainstream media brings up. Uh things that you guys are doing. Of course, they're trying to downplay or bring up the old crazy Uncle Ron Paul type of deal, but hey, yeah, I'll take a crazy great. Uncle I mean, Ron Paul over a John McCain any day of the week. I, I love it when the neocons attack us. They, they think that they're doing us harm, but they're actually doing us a huge favor because it, it shows our friends and even our donors, to be honest, that, hey, they're doing something right if they're irritating Bill Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, guys. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, uh, John. <laughs> That's right. No doubt about that. And speaking of Mr. Bill Crystal Com or not Commie, yeah, he is. So I wanted to ask you. I, I wrote to you about this the other day. This new uh, Senator Cotton. I, can I read something real quick about him? And get your response from it. All right. He says that the alarm should be sounding on our ears, and this was his uh, first big speech for on the Senate floor. Our enemies, sensing weakness and hence opportunity, have become steadily more aggressive. Our allies, uncertain of our commitment capability, have begun to conclude that they must look out for themselves, even where it is unhelpful to stability and order. Our military, suffering from years of neglect, which, that's funny, has seen its relative strength decline to historical levers, levels. And he goes on, and this is the part that I sat back and just went, Wow, this guy's a nut job. He says, America must have such hegemonic strengths that no sane adversary would ever imagine challenging the United States. Good enough is not and will never be good enough. The strength, he said, should come from whatever the necessary cost. While the budget must be slashed, it should not be balanced on the back of the military. And then, this is... <laughs> good night. Our enemies and allies alike must know that aggressors will pay an unspeakable price for challenging the United States. The best way to impose that price is global military dominance. Oh, my gosh. 
Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it makes it makes Stalin sound like a pansy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't dare ever. I I sent that article to a friend of mine, and he wrote me back, and he said, these guys literally want to be attacked. They want the United States to be attacked. Yeah. But, you know, the other thing is, you know what he sounds like to me? He's, you know, I bet he would laugh at this. He sounds like a commie to me. You know, he sounds like a socialist. He wants to use American the American government to make the rest of the world safe for, for crony capitalists, for well-connected corporations, because he knows he, he should know very well there's no threat to the U.S. source. When he talks about projecting power, he talks about protecting sea lanes. He talks about um, uh, making, making it easier for to socialize the cost of well-connected companies so that they can privatize the profits and then, and then put them in, in his campaign coffers. So, you know, this guy is not, he's no capitalist. He's no free marketer. By any stretch, he's a status, and a, you know, and basically a closet commie. What's really sad about him is so many people that go off and they you know, back up and backing up just for a second. He's the perfect neocon because what he's one of the very few that have actually been in the military, and they must love that because I'm sure it drove them crazy to be called chicken hawks like they are. <laughs> you know, so cotton is cotton is perfect. But what's really sad is you most often see folks like that who have gone into these no win horrible wars that make things worse and they come home as great anti-war people and you know people opposed to the empire but it came back even worse so hmm. it's uh it's, it's pretty sad well i don't think that uh, the million dollars that uh bill crystal's little association gave him for his campaign has anything to do with that but I think it certainly helped, but you know, I bet I'm sure he was already there. Yeah. You know, and uh, so it's not; it wasn't necessarily pay to play, but I'm sure it didn't. It didn't hurt him. You know, it probably goes a long way where he's from. Wow. Well, you know, speaking of Bill, Bill Crystal, the that philosophy is uh, it's Trotskyite. I mean, Bill Crystal is a Trotskyite, the com- yeah. and which is uh, communist. The communists couldn't find a home in the U.S., so they had to reform themselves as neocons. Absolutely, absolutely, and the they, exact same people. And it's so it's so sad that the uh, conservatives of the world, or of the world, the conservatives of the United States, people that would call themselves uh, small government constitutionalist or whatever they they mm-hmm. try to pass off, they love this kind of stuff. They love I think it. They, they unfortunately they're they've, they're mistaken in their beliefs that it's somehow, you know, less masculine to be in favor of peace. And I think, you know, the, the, maybe the peace movement has been given a bad rap by hippies or something, I don't know. But, you know, somehow that to be tough is to, is to you know, to be warlike and to be pro-empire. And it, it's, it's really an unfortunate misperception, because while you're being tough and beating your chest, you're destroying the nation's economy. And then when we're at our knees, does Tom Cotton think all the people whose eyes you've poked when we're on our knees because our economy's collapsed. Does he think they're going to be kind to us? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That, that's a really very good point. Yeah, Mr. Cotton, explain this to your new Chinese overlord. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... Well, they, they clearly do share the same philosophy with people like Kim Jong-un. In fact, we commented on that a couple of weeks ago that, uh, with uh, Sean Hannity, Kim yep. Sean Hannity, we call him. <laughs> Kim Sean Hannity, yep, we have to have... That, uh, you, you need to have a strong military to have a strong economy. I mean, yep. it's, a, it's a direct quote from Kim Jong-un, and, and the neocons are repeating it over and over. But they're even, worse. they're even worse because poor old Kim, at least, is just an old Stalinist. He doesn't <laughs> want to take over, and he's not invading Tibet or something, you know. He's... That's he's a, a bad guy, but the neocons are worse. That's exactly right. <laughs> if he was a Trotskyite, he'd really be have something going on. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's funny, but it, it's not. But at the same time, we got to laugh about something. I mean, they're so absurd. They're so absurd, yeah. we have to laugh at them. And what, what makes me most upset and, and, and most unhappy is, unfortunately, I have to admit this, that the, that the neocon propaganda techniques they do continue to work. And, you know, we, you pointed out Russia earlier. It, it's the same thing that Dr. Paul got when he was going against the Iraq war. Oh, he's just, in, he's just in love with Saddam. He's favored by Saddam. He's probably paid by Saddam. And, you know, the same thing has happened now to those of us who are opposing this insane march toward war with a nuclear-armed Russia that, you know, as you said earlier, you know, because I appear on 
on RT and say what I would say on any place, including your show. That makes me, uh, I mean, the pay of Putin, and I'm a Putin lover, and I'm a Russia lover, and this sort of thing. And it's just the same old garbage. You know, it goes back to what was the um, the famous quote uh, uh, from the uh, from the Nuremberg trials, you know, where they talked about how uh, Hermann Goering talked about how easy it is to, to march a people off to war, regardless of whether they're democracies, dictatorships. You know, you just call the other guy unpatriotic and this and that. And my gosh, it still works. And that, that, that makes me want to work harder, but it also makes me a little disappointed. <laughs> no kidding. That's a really excellent point. There's a lot to learn from the Nuremberg trials, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know. Unfortunately, because yeah. we haven't learned very much from those. Absolutely. Just the whole, uh, just doing my duty. <laughs> yeah. There's a higher duty, isn't there? Um, boy, I don't know. Since we're we're with cotton, can we? Uh, I'd like to get. Well, I know what your opinion is because I've been reading you every day. But let's uh, for the listeners. Let's talk about uh, this letter that was sent to Iran, and I mean it's just oh, so frustrating. These guys, these neocons, and and these are the. Uh, the Senator Cottons, the McCains, the Lindsey Grahams, I mean, there's so many of them, unfortunately, that are in power. It seems like they want, they want a war with Iran. They do not care about any, I mean, Obama, I don't like the guy at all. But I'm glad that he's at least going to the table to talk to Iran to find a peaceful solution. Would you, yeah. would you want to talk about the the letter that was sent? Because... For the most part, what I've read, of course, there's usually neocon sites with, but the opinions that people write in, it's just like, oh well, you know, Iran, Iran, Iran. We we've got to do something because they're on the verge of killing us and blah blah blah. And then you have the people like Sean Hannity saying, oh well, this is great because, you know, the Tom Cotton letter is teaching Iran American constitutionalism. <laughs> <laughs> You know, on, on that on that note, I saw a great someone posted a great uh, 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 Twitter a, a picture on Twitter, and it said um, something went to the to the tune of uh, uh, you know uh, Tom Cotton wants to school these Iranian cabinet uh, ministers on the U.S. Constitution, and then above each one of these fellows, it showed where they went to school, and it was <laughs> MIT, UC Berkeley, Harvard. You know, all of these Iranian ministers who have gone through the most elite U.S. universities, you know, because the letter was pretty condescending, saying, you know, gosh, you may not understand our Constitution. These guys probably studied it much more than, than uh, someone like Cotton, maybe, you know. Oh, I, I would say probably no doubt. They probably understand it inside and out compared to most of, yeah. well, any politician that I've seen open his mouth lately. Well, Tom Cotton is not a stupid man. He does have, you know, some degrees from pretty elite universities. So it's easy just to write him off as, as some, uh, you know, Ill, ill-educated, uh, you know, lump. I don't think that's the case at all. But you know, on, on the letter, I think, I think Congress certainly has uh, a right to make its positions known on matters of foreign policy. Uh, I think that's a given, and I think they they should, you know, if anything, Dr. Paul over the years um, decried the fact that they were. They were far too reluctant to make their positions known. But, you know, it seems that the letter was, was intended to do something slightly different than that, or very different from that, which is, as you say, to scuttle the talk. Uh, you know, if Congress wanted to make itself known, it could. There, there are other things that it could have done that would have been more constructive. But, you know, I also like to, you know, if you have to see a silver lining in that cloud, and, you know, if, if and, you know, people are going to maybe think I'm, I'm nuts, but... If you look at it sort of in a, as a Leninist or something, if if the talks do break down, you know, the, these are U.N. negotiations. The P5 plus one are a U.N. negotiation. Right. It's, not a bi- it's not a bilateral treaty between the U.S. and Iran. So if, if the Iranians uh, start feeling reluctant to view the U.S. as a reliable partner, you, what you could see is in the U.N. a breakdown of the sanctions regime against Iran. Hmm. And once that happens, once the U.S. partners and even reluctant partners in the sanctions say, okay, the U.S. has shown itself to be completely unreliable. You can't make a deal with them. Uh, we're going to we're going to cancel the sanctions, and we're going to go ahead and, and, and make our peace with Iran. 
at that moment, I think, will be the end of the U.S. empire. And uh, I think pro-peace people will think that that's probably, ultimately, a pretty good thing. Wow. Hmm. So there's a there's a there's a wild uh, a wild look at at, at at the silver lining perhaps of this letter. Absolutely, there is something. Mike and I are looking at each other, going, "Hmm, that's something to ponder." <laughs> Hadn't even thought about that one. Well, and and you would hope, I mean, if you look at the European nations involved, they're actually not directly next door, but they're basically in the back neighborhood of Iran and. They have, I would think, they have a good reason to want peace because if all the things that Benjamin Netanyahu and these these other yahoos say about mm-hmm. Iran are true, I mean, they would be in great danger. So they would, you would think that they have a greater urgency to sue for peace rather than the United States, which is sitting several thousand miles away pushing the buttons. Yeah, sure, and I think... You know, that doesn't mean that I prefer the second scenario. I think there's a silver lining in it. I think it would be best if, if peace prevailed and if the world, you know, became, began to understand that diplomacy can work and that things can't be worked out. And, you know, that would certainly be preferable. There's no question about it. And you're right, the Europeans, not only do they stand to gain in terms of their own security, but also financially and economically, trading with Iran is going to be a huge boon. You know, they've already taken a huge hit with these Russia sanctions. They're, they're following the U.S. foreign policy of sanctioning everything that doesn't bow down before Washington. And, and they're following it into their own recessions. And I'm sure they'd be more than happy to get out of these sanctions and to start doing business with Russia and Iran again. Well, absolutely. You would, you would think so. We talked about last time you were on with this, I believe we talked about Poland when they sued because... Uh, the World Trade Organization or whatever, because Russia put a ban on buying Polish apples because they were they were going along with the sanctions. And then when they when Russia basically sanctioned them back, they're like, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so funny, I think, that... Uh, and I, I really find this with the normal, your everyday American Joe... When the United States does something like this with a uh, sanctions or whatever, then it's it's a righteous sanction. But if someone turns around and does something back, it's like, hey, who do they think they are? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what's another good example of that is this whole issue. I don't know if you want to get into this, but this whole issue of military exercises in Eastern Europe. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I've been watching this for the past few months, this Operation Atlantic Resolve. Hmm. And I even wrote a short little piece on one where the all of these U.S. Um, uh, military uh, uh, vehicles were like three football fields from the Russian border, mm-hmm. you know, holding a parade, you know, and it's, it's, that is just fine and dandy. As a matter of fact, I was reading today, you're going to believe this, that this huge military convoy is going to go from Riga, Latvia, all the way back to its base in Germany, driving through all of these countries. I forget what they're calling <laughs> some sort of brigadoon or something, and and there was an, it was an article about this mayor of a small Czech town who was, who was you know found out through the media that this whole you know circus is going to be marching through his little town and he's worried about the traffic jams and what have you. <laughs> but but all, but all of this saber rattling right on Russia's border is totally fine and dandy. But whenever Russia holds um, military exercises within its own borders, it's a huge provocation. It uh, just shows that they're ready for an invasion or something. You know, so it's exactly what you're saying. It is pretty amazing. I, I was reading something not too long ago that the uh, right along with what you're just saying with uh, the United States having these exercises literally within 22 caliber rifle shot of Russia's borders, and that's not a provocation. Russia has 40,000 soldiers on the border of Ukraine. Oh, my goodness, they're going to take over the whole Europe. It's just like, What? <laughs> But people don't see it. That's what drives me nuts, Daniel, is that people are literally like, wow, those Russians are really aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that Putin needs another Hitler. <laughs> and, but, <laughs> but we're not aggressive when we send ships, tanks, paratroopers, whatever, right on their border, even though we promised okay. not to do that. 
Just think if there was a comparable um, level of unrest on the U.S. border with Mexico. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't tell me that the U.S. And, it, and to be honest, I think if the U.S. did not have its military on alert, it would be it would be um, remiss in its obligations to keep America secure. If there was a danger of some uh, some uh, takeover, some, uh, some some civil war spilling over into U.S. soil. You think that the U.S. would be on alert and would be concerned about it? I would hope they would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's legitimate. That's called defense. Yeah, if, like uh, Dr. Ron Paul talked about, if there was 100,000 Chinese soldiers on the border of Mexico and the United States, we might have a problem with that. Yeah, or at least we'd be concerned and be on alert and we'd maybe move some troops down there. Yes, but we're or, we're exceptional, Daniel. Or the CIA would pay them <laughs> off to ship drugs or something. <laughs> we're exceptional. We we get to pick and choose. What do you, you gonna, see? You, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, can you imagine how irritating that is for other countries to keep hearing that? You know, hmm. and everyone feels pride in their nation. Everyone feels hmm. in their own way that their country is exceptional. But to have it jammed down their throat that we're the only exceptional people, and all of you want to secretly be like us. It's just so galling, you know. I mean, I spent a lot of time living overseas, and I know that people, it, they just they hate that. And they like America. They like a lot about us. But that kind of thing just really rubs people the wrong way, and I just think that's, it's just natural to be rubbed the wrong way. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. No doubt about it. I mean, we would, if, uh, well, I remember, I'm sure you do, when uh, maybe it's been a year now, but when Rush or uh, Putin, after Obama gave his uh, exceptionalism sp- uh, speech, I think it was about a year ago, his State of the Union address, and and he said, no, we're all except, I don't know if he said we're all exceptional, but he said, you know what, we're all God's children. You guys don't hold that on your own. <laughs> and, and people just went nuts. I remember, I didn't listen to him, but I remember reading about Rush Limbaugh said, who, who, who does he think he is? We, well, yes, we are exceptional. How can he say that? <laughs> yeah, I know. It was, it was such a reasonable statement that he made, and, and I, I don't know, people are just brainwashed, you know, it's, and it doesn't. It doesn't make. It doesn't mean that we love. We love Putin, and we, you know, we just, you know, we have posters of him. But when he <laughs> doesn't say something that makes sense, what are you going to? What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't support any state. But when someone says something exactly. that's the truth, there's nothing wrong with saying, "Hey, there's the truth." Right. Especially when it's against the the warmongers that are trying to put us. I mean. <laughs> You know, I, I still haven't figured this one out, Daniel, is how in the world can any sane person want to push Russia that has nuclear missiles into a war? Why would we even think that we could do that? Why would – it just boggles my mind. I have teenage boys. I yeah. don't want them to go to war. And over what? You know, over a country that, sorry, is pretty insignificant. Ukraine is an impoverished country. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an absolute basket case. It's run by – a small handful of crazed oligarchs, you know, and is this really worth it? And a part of it wants to secede. Hmm. You know, as, as I mentioned this last week in another interview, seceding is, is, is a pro-freedom move. You know, that's what we did. That's how we became our exceptional nation. We seceded from Great Britain. Yeah. Secession is great. The people in Crimea did not want to be part of a, of a government that had been taken over by, by people from the streets, and so they did what what pro-freedom people should celebrate. They seceded. You know, secession is a great thing. Yeah, it's an American heritage. If you can't secede, then you're in prison. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly right. All the way down to personal secession. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know if you guys happened to see the um, the Mises Circle did, a, um, did an event in Houston in January, and I think most of the speeches are online, but I was particularly... Um, uh, touched by my former colleague Jeff Dice's speech, which I think was really great, and I really recommend it, but he made that exact same point, that he said, you know, secede from your television, you know, <laughs> secede from your, and he named all these things within our personal lives that are, that are, that are damaging, you know, to our freedom and to our consciousness, and I thought it was just a, really a great point. It's really, if you haven't seen it, it's really worth uh, checking out that speech. Yes, I'm glad you brought it up. We actually played the whole speech on our radio show. We just shut our mouths and played Jeff's whole speech. Oh, great. It was just fantastic. He did it such was. a great job. Yeah, I think so, too. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> such a great job. Man. 
I need to get down there and meet you guys someday. Anyways, um, the uh, come on, we're we're, uh, we're over here. We got a bayou. We got some boats. You know, <laughs> my son's my son's starting to learn how to fish. So right on. Well, like I said, you, you got to get up here because you don't even have to know how to fish in Alaska. You just <laughs> put the hook out and something's gonna grab it all day long. Sounds great. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> uh, all the, right. The um. Do you, man, th- this whole thing with uh, France and, and Germany trying to broker the peace deal there with uh, Ukraine, and it just seems like the United States is trying to destroy that. And it, it almost seemed like the U.S. was perturbed that they weren't involved in it in the very first place. How, and I've asked you this before, is Germany going to stand up, do you think? It's one. It's amazing how much abuse they've taken and, and are still taking. You know, I don't know if you happen to notice, but there was a report that uh, when Victoria Newland was in Munich for the security conference just uh, what about a month or so ago, mm-hmm. that was right at the time that France and Germany were trying to broker the deal, and that she had. It was reported that when she was meeting with all with the U.S. delegation to the conference, she was absolutely dismissive. I think she used a few of her famous colorful words <laughs> to describe the European participation in this. So, you know, it's amazing. I'm sure you guys have seen and have talked about the article in uh, Der Spiegel, I think it was, about how, you know, the German intelligence agencies are convinced that these American generals are totally insane. Yes, mm-hmm. that was amazing. That was an amazing thing that they came out with that. And- it was, and I, I forget, someone pointed out that, you know, and I don't know, I, I'm not an expert, but... Someone pointed out that an article like this would not have been uh, would not have come out if it, you know if the German government had really been opposed to it. I mean, they suspected that it was kind of leaked from inside, trying to get a message across. Hmm. And didn't uh, I, if I remember right, they even somewhat quoted uh, American intelligence saying, "Yeah, we don't know where this guy got this." Yeah, that was the amazing part too. And, you know, that reminds me of something that we saw that just come out this past week about the National Intelligence Estimate for Iraq in 2002 hmm. and how that's been declassified. And uh, I don't know if it's been completely declassified, but much more of it has been declassified. And it shows the same thing, that it was absolutely obvious that the intelligence community absolutely did not believe, did not have any evidence for the things that the Bush people were saying at the time. And so, I mean, it just happen- It sounds like it's happening all over again. It's a terrible replay. Wow. And it makes me sad, too, because I was suckered into that whole thing. I had friends in the military, best friend in the military, and it was just like, well, if that's what we need to do, we need to do it. And we got to support them because I don't want them to die. And uh, I feel... Yeah, but at least, I mean, at at least if, you know, you recognize the mistake, most people aren't recognizing that it's happening all over again. It's a bad remake of a movie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, 11 years later even after, and 12 years later, and it's still, people won't admit what a mistake it was. And even, you know, the uh, in the Iran issue, the uh, it's been leaked that uh, Mossad, and, and I think we've known for a few years that our own intelligence agencies have said outright, Iran, Iran does not have a nuclear weapons not only the capability, but they don't even have a program. Yeah, that's, that was really, you're right, that was really interesting because it was similar to what happened in the U.S., you know, that uh, all the while Netanyahu was holding up that picture of a bomb and everything, <laughs> his own intelligence people were thinking the same thing, this guy's bonkers, you know, there's yeah. nothing to it. So, they, you know, it shows they have the same problems we have. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, you know, he, obviously, you know, he was just here speaking to Congress and... It was really, I was a little bit disgusted to watch the way, I think uh, uh, Will Grigg even mocked him a little bit in an article about how they they couldn't stand up and clap fast enough or long enough, and you better not be the one that didn't clap enough slower than the guy next to you because you're going to get ridiculed the next day. <laughs> <laughs> or worse. Or, <laughs> yeah. And yet, uh, I think... Uh, Oh, shoot. I can't remember the gal's name. From uh, antiwar.com. And she pointed out how Netanyahu's been saying this since 19, 1992. Mm-hmm. The same yeah. thing. For yeah, that's right. 23 years. Iran is one year from the bomb. Um, that was 23 years ago. 
<laughs> Why does and this honestly, work? I mean, honestly, would would it even matter if Iran had the bomb? I mean, it's a country that hasn't attacked anyone in 250 years. That's I mean, right. The entire time the U.S. has been in existence, they haven't gone to war. We're, or, uh, haven't offensively gone to war with anyone, uh, except but the U.S. has gone to war. Uh, what 93 percent of its existence? Exactly. But you know what the neocons do is they say, well, that is an exceptional case because Iran is not run by rational people. They're run by clinically insane people. <laughs> but what have they so done to show that? <laughs> exactly. I mean, if, if, if the three of us played amateur psychiatrists and we tried to look at what behaviors they were exhibiting that made us think they were insane, you know, uh, we, may not, we may not like the orientation of their society or the strict interpretation of you know, religion in the public square, Right. But in terms of doing things that are absolutely crazy, like running down the street naked, they're not <laughs> demonstrating any of those any of those characteristics. No, I think if we were the clinical people, we would uh, be putting some cuffs, the straight jackets on old Bill Crystal and his ilk and locking them up for a little while. Because <laughs> they show insanity. I mean, the, the things that these guys say, literally in my mind anyways, is it's just plain insanity. I can't even, ugh. It hurts my brain, unfortunately. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't have a lot of brain cells left to be able to focus on this stuff, and they kill them constantly, just bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the same issue with ISIS. You know, wh whenever I think about Syria, ISIS, and whatnot, and uh, I, I think about this a lot with you and Dr. Paul and, and the, the people that uh, project peace, how you guys are supposedly Putin lovers and Ron Paul is a Saddam lover, whatever. And yet, who do we see? I mean, anyone can go on YouTube with the old stories of uh, Rumsfeld sitting across from Saddam Hussein, shaking his hand and loving on him and everything, or the, the leaders that have uh, very recently met with uh, Assad, you know, within the last few years ago. Shaking yeah, Gaddafi. hands. Yep, Gaddafi, exactly. And even more recently, the the very wonderful John McCain showing shaking <laughs> hands with ISIS, Al Qaeda. <laughs> hey, he's a great one. And before that he was shaking hands with Nazis in Ukraine. Oh my gosh, I didn't think <laughs> Remember that that picture of him with yep. um, I forget, you know, the guy's names, but the guy was he's the founder of the National Socialist Party of Ukraine. I mean <laughs> Shouldn't that have been a tip off? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the staff? No, no, it seems like a good guy. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a good guy. And you can just imagine uh, if someone like you was in that photo shoot. Oh, my goodness. The whole, what an uproar there would be. Of course, you never would be, but just. Yeah, just I pointing do. out the truth. You're you're accused of such things, and a guy can stand next to him and shake their hands. It's like, oh no, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> doesn't it seem like something out of 1984? You know, or the <laughs> thing that you see right in front of you is actually not what you're seeing. Yeah, Daniel, I I'm not paying attention to the time. We have to take a break. Can you stay with us, or do you need to run? Cool, well, I can stay for a little bit longer. Okay, if you would, we we've got about a three minute break, and we'll be right back to you. Is that all right? Okay, sounds good. All righty. Thank you, sir. We'll be right back. This is Patriots and Men on Radio. It's where you can talk about the real issues facing you. Okay, we're just going to get back at it because we're already tortured long enough to listen to Fox News. Dan, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Great. Thank you for that. I... I'm sorry we had to do that. We're we're at an actual radio station, so we're forced to listen to Fox News at the top and bottom of the hour. Sometimes it's just ugh. well, don't don't insult your host. <laughs> What's fun is that uh, a lot of times uh, what we're talking about, they end up making our point when we get to the top of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike wanted to ask you something about uh, Greece. I don't know if you'd heard about it, but the uh, Greece is demanding reparations from Germany to kind of help their uh, economic situation, I guess, for the Nazi occupation of Greece. Yeah, it is It is interesting. And I, I, I've seen the headlines. I've looked into it a little bit. But I wonder how much the, you know, the government of Greece is feeling the pressure because they campaigned on, on a much different platform than they seem to be ending up with. Mm. You know, they, they've... Uh, 
they've really sort of uh, turned their backs on all of their campaign promises, making a deal with the uh, with the European Commission, and uh, so maybe they're maybe this is kind of a populist uh, attempt to um, to you know get back on the good graces of the people who voted for them. Well, just, yeah, it just kind of struck me because uh, um, you know when people are are short on money, they don't know where to go. They'll they'll turn back to try to find someone that owes them and go after it. And it just seems to be that Greece is even more desperate now for for cash than they were before. And I'm wondering what 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 signs does this show for uh, well for the future of Greece and for the future of the euro. Yeah, well, the other thing is, what about the future? Not that I'm a huge fan of the concept, but the future of democracy. You know, when you, when basically, and this is um, uh, John Lachlan, who's on the who's on the board of um, of the Ron Paul Institute, an old friend of mine from from when I when I lived overseas, he made a great point in a recent interview where he said this is you know essentially the um, the European Union is a post democratic organization. It doesn't matter really who the people vote for. The program moves on according to plan. So it's uh, that's also quite chilling, I think. Well, and who would have thought that uh, politicians like the the Greeks that were just elected would break their promise? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. Get used to it. <laughs> but the other thing is that look at all of the speculators who will who will end up getting paid. You know, the people who, you know, the people like. The, and I'm not. I'm again. I'm not I'm an expert in international finance by any stretch. But it seems to me that a lot of people were attracted to the high interest rates and in a very highly speculatory. Uh, environment in Greece, and so they gambled their money, uh, hoping for a big return, and uh, and now they want to get paid, you know, <laughs> these big these big returns. And everyone m- likes to make it think as if you know it's just because the Greeks were lazy and they were living high off the hog, but you know there were a lot of other components to Greece's problems that aren't really getting talked about. <laughs> yep, and I didn't have a whole lot of what the heck is that? I didn't have a whole lot of. Uh faced with the new government that came in when the uh, the finance minister said that uh, to that he was a libertarian socialist. What? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's going to be some good things coming out of these folks. <laughs> like being a meat-loving vegetarian or something. <laughs> <laughs> what an oxymoron. No joke. That's just, just funny. The... Uh, I, I wanted to ask you something. We were talking about defense and, you know, the military, and I think uh, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the Ron Paul Institute, but I think I know that uh, you guys want to see the troops come home out of, and not just, you know, out of Afghanistan and Iraq. We want to come out of, why are we still in Germany? Why are we still in Japan? Why are we all over the world? You know, I, I saw a really interesting, kind of a funny um deal my brother texted me it was a picture and it said aggressive russia how dare they put their country so close to all of our military bases <laughs> <laughs> but if you would let's go a little bit off on libertarianism how how do you see real defense i mean do you see the uh the united states military as the the optimal, even if they came home, the optimal defense force or what? I mean, obviously, I would much prefer the United States military if it was just a defensive force in America. I could accept that a little bit more than what I see now. But ultimately, I don't even think that that's even the optimal. What are your thoughts on that? It's a question of the doable versus the optimal. You know, the founding fathers were would, would be appalled at the idea of a standing army. You know, that's the last thing they wanted, and I think they understood that. You know, like it, like like Switzerland with its citizen army, that um, that if people felt threatened by by an aggressor, they would you know they'd be the first one to uh, to come and, and to you know grab their guns and go. Mm-hmm. So the idea of whether we need a standing army, even I think, is a good question, but. You know, at the very least, as you say, if, if we can close these bases overseas that serve no purpose, uh, in, in a matter of fact, they don't keep us safe. They, they make us much less safe because they just they provide targets and they provide an irritant to people. And, you know, Dr. Paul's often, as he's always said, you know, people who are getting involved in terrorism are motivated, motivated by the perception. And, you know, Robert Pape wrote about this, too. They're motivated by the perception 
that they're occupied. Hmm. And having hmm. all these well-armed Americans running around uh, gives that perception. And even in places where they might be slightly more welcome, you know, they do provide a boon to the local economy, probably in places like Germany. Uh, even in those places, uh, you know, they'd be, they'd be better off without them. Yeah, and I, I think that they probably feel like with uh, Germany's Germany's um, relations with Russia. I'm sure they feel a little bit pressured or threatened by having our military there. I would think yeah, that, it's that they have to the follow. Yeah. Well, look at the look at the Okinawans. They they want yeah. the U.S. to get out of their country. They don't want these U.S. bases there. Uh, it, you know, they provoke China. They're destroying the environment there. I think they're building a new base right on a uh, a beautiful coral reef, uh, you know, a, a, a park, a, a water park, coral reef, you know, sort of thing. And they don't, they just don't want them there. They don't feel the need to have them there. And and you know, the corrupt leadership in Japan is all part of the global elite. You know, they they certainly are not going to listen to what their people say when it comes to that. I thought we were going to pull out of Okinawa. No, they're building a new base. They're pulling out of the base they're in, but they're they're moving to. As I understand it, they're relocating a base. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yeah. That's uh, pulling out of Okinawa. <laughs> nope, we're pulling out of our base. Well, they're Ooh. trying to move yeah. back into the Philippines too. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And all this costs a lot of money too. Yeah. You know, I I think I look at uh, our consternation with Russia and, and the sa- saber rattling and everything. And how foolish it is if I was um, in the Chinese government and I saw that that uh, push that they're doing against Russia. Wouldn't wouldn't you think if we were so stupid to start a fight with Russia, wouldn't China get involved knowing that they're next on the list? They would have to think that at least. Yeah, but certainly I would think feel uncomfortable, you know, having such a long border with Russia. If, if things got to that, it would be very uncomfortable, I think. The Chinese, in my opinion, have been in self-denial for quite a long time about the spending behaviors of the United States. Hmm. It's probably because they've, they've always held so much debt. But you, you can already see moves toward de-dollarization. You know, that you can almost daily, all you have to do is, you know, click on the zero hedge. And, hmm. and you'll see in any given day, you know, five or six indications of, of, the, of global de-dollarization. And I don't think people really understand the implications of that. Wow. Yeah, and I just saw the um, uh, the United States was upset about several European countries joining the uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it's, it's a, a Chinese lending bank. Asian Investment Bank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, 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 the UK joined it. Yeah. Yes, and Australia, and uh, so it's yeah, it's, it's it's they're hedging their bets because I think they look at eighteen trillion dollars in debt, and like how many how many trillions. In, in private debt in the U.S., and they're thinking, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this will catch up to them someday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. So uh, the world is the world is so insane, and that your job is looking at how insane the world is and making sense of it and telling the well, basically the whole world what the truth is. How do you get how do you get through the day with that? Because I have just a regular job and on my, I guess, off time, I read this stuff and try to follow it, and it drives me nuts. How do you keep saying, Daniel? <laughs> it can be a little bit depressing, but you sort of enjoy the fight. And I, I, to be honest, I really enjoy the people who read the things on, on the Ron Paul Institute. And, you know, I, I wanted from the very beginning, Dr. Paul and I both felt that the Institute you know, should not be like a classic think tank where you have a bunch of PhDs going on about this theory or that, you know, but it should just be, I don't know, the kind of stuff that I want to read, which is Hmm. kind of easy reading. You know, and I I have to admit, I'm often sarcastic when I, especially when I do something for our Neocon Watch section, (laughs) I try to be a little bit sarcastic, and I guess that sarcasm is is pretty good, you know, good for the psychology, I think. I love it. I love, yeah, it definitely comes through. I love that. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm awfully lucky. I mean, we moved down to Texas, and I'm and I'm lucky to be to be spending time with Dr. Paul and soaking up his wisdom. And you know, it's just a, it's just a real treat for me. I have to say. Hmm. That no, that's great. I I can't even imagine. But I got to say, just uh, watching you, especially since uh, the Ron Paul Institute has been started and everything. He's lucky to have you, Daniel. You are awesome. <laughs> well, 
Oh, that's too kind of you. <laughs> You're doing a, a great job, and I, I love the uh, the Liberty Report. Like I said earlier, that I I look every day to see if you guys did a new one, and I'm excited to see where that's going to go. And it's just, folks, you got to look up the Ron Paul Institute and read it every day. I I look at it every day to see if there's a new blog, the Neocon Watch. <laughs> I love that. And the Liberty <laughs> Report. And Lou Rockwell's been great. He's been posting it up and on his blog, and you've been posting up the Liberty Report on, on his blog also. And and it's just good work. It's it's the truth, and I can't thank you guys enough for, uh, for doing what you do. And I just can't encourage people enough to join the Ron Paul Institute and support what you're doing because it is important. Look at what's going on in the world today the threats that not to us the threats of the people that are here are putting against us and putting against the whole world and you guys are taking it taking it on full full brunt and it's well thanks very much and i really appreciate getting the chance to talk to you guys again you know hopefully i'd love to do it again sooner than than our last break between talks <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate that and before we go, just uh, give some more information about the Ron Paul Institute, how people can find you and how they can support you and the other work that you might be doing or just, well, basically, you can go to the Ron Paul Institute online there and find everything you guys are doing. Sure, ronpaulinstitute.org. And, you know, we're, we're approaching our second birthday, which I'm really surprised. A lot of people said we couldn't survive at all, but... but after two years, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy that there is a lot of interest. We're, we have well over 100,000 followers on Facebook, which is <laughs> great. Awesome. Um, it's such a thrill to have all these people. And we've, we've mostly focused on, on publishing and writing and, and public speaking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to a peace conference in, in Houston in a couple of weeks. And so we've mostly done that. We haven't really launched a lot of programs as such yet, but we're hoping to, to get into that. You know, we're... We're still really small. We have a tiny budget, and we don't, you know, we don't want to tank it in the red on any of this stuff. So we're we're slowly, you know, moving toward having some kinds of programs. But I think our chief focus will always be publishing and speaking in, in the future. Well, that's great. But we um we have what I'm also really thrilled about is we have supporters from all over the world. You know, just hmm. regular Joes, regular individuals from, you know, Australia will send us ten dollars. You know, or. Hmm. Uh, uh, in Norway or something, and it's just such a thrill to see people that are interested in peace all over the world. You know, it's it's just great. That's very encouraging because I think, uh, at least I do, focus too much on uh, liberty movement or peace right here in America, where you know we want peace for everyone and prosperity for everyone in the whole world. What's wrong with that? And I think I think probably a lot of people overseas would like America to be a lot less militaristic, so it's probably in their self-interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they probably look, uh, no doubt about it, peace and prosperity. America, go home. We'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's trade with each other. <laughs> oh, no doubt. You know, that's, that's so important. I think I asked you last time when you were with us, because Ron Paul is so adamant about that, that – trading with each other and our founding fathers were so adamant about it stay out of the foreign entanglements just trade trade with one yeah. another and we would be so much more prosperous here at home if we uh, absolutely just got frustrated sorry <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's so great talking with you guys. I really appreciate it. All right, Daniel. Thank you very much, folks. This was Daniel McAdams from Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Sir, you are doing a great job. We love you. And we need to fly you up here to give a speech here to us here. And maybe we could do that right around moose season. Uh, that sounds about right. That sounds good. Uh, you guys keep up the great work. I, I love I love what I hear from your show. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I, and I told Dr. Paul all about it, too. And he's, he's He's thrilled with it too. Well, that's awesome. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, right. keep up the good fight and be faith, be safe, brother. We we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye, guys. Bye. Bye. All right. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. I love Daniel. He uh, just puts it out there how it is. You know, I, it sounds like Ron Paul knows about the show now. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fun.